Thank you all for having me on this meeting. My name is Natalia Pasternak. I am a microbiologist by background from Brazil. I had my PhD at the University of Sao Paulo and then several postdoc fellowships after that. And after a while working with bacteria in the lab, so I come from the lab, from the bench, uh, and uh, I, I actually miss my bacteria. They're, they're much nicer than people. But I had a shift in my career, and I stopped working with bacteria and actually started working with people, with science communication. And that was a hard shift, and it came in a very unusual way. So I was very happy working at the lab. Uh, when after my daughter was born and when she started school, I suddenly got caught into this kind of bizarre tool called the WhatsApp group for moms. So all the mothers had a messaging group, a WhatsApp group, and at that time uh, it was a more sexist world, so it was just the mothers, not the fathers, and uh, they shared information about uh, raising children and school things and everything, and uh, but there was something that bothered me in that group because there was a lot of pseudoscientific crap going on. And I mean, really, you have no idea uh, what kinds of pseudoscience appear in the group. But at the beginning, I stayed very quiet because, well, I really wanted them to like me. Uh, and all of a sudden, anti-vax information was shared in the group. And there was some of the mothers who were really trying to push this kind of disinformation onto the others and trying to convince them not to vaccinate their children because they really believed that it could harm the children. And so that's the point when I realized that I, I couldn't stay silent. I'm a scientist, I'm a microbiologist, I worked in a vaccine lab. Uh, so I introduced myself and I explained that I was a scientist, that I was from the university, and I, I started to explain how we know that vaccines are safe, how the research is done, uh, how the anti-vax movement actually began. And I told all the story about Andrew Wakefield and the fake paper and the MMR vaccine and how he was actually been paid for by lawyers to do that and they got really interested and they asked a lot of questions saying wow so this is how it began was the guy arrested what happened to him why do people believe it and I, I, I was so happy because they were interacting so much and I said wow this science communication thing really works and then I got so enthusiastic that I began to talk about homeopathy and acupuncture and florals and crystals, and they blocked me. And then I realized, well, I think it's not that easy. And it isn't, really. Uh, I was doing it with no training, uh, not really knowing my way, way around talking to people. As I said, I worked with bacteria before. Uh, and then, uh, but at that point, there was a shift in my life when I realized that this was important work and it was not done professionally and it was not done enough and it was not done enough by scientists. We, we keep ourselves inside the university's bubbles and we don't realize that people on the outside, clever people, well-intentioned people, they believe all kinds of weird things because no one really took the time to explain it to them. So I decided that I would take the time, but I also decided that I would really study the field and do it professionally. I started really digging into science communication papers and, and pseudoscience books and psychology books to see how people were really handling it in a scientific way. And I partnered with people who were already doing it professionally. So I said, okay, 
uh, are you all you are all working independently with science communication and I really think that we need to do it professionally in an organized way and so we started an NGO in Brazil an institute called Instituto Questão de Ciência or Question of Science Institute and there are four of us who founded the institute myself uh, a professor of theoretical physics Marcelo Yamashita the science journalist journalist Carlos Orsi and a psychologist and lawyer Paulo Almeida. So the four of us, we combine very different skills. I come from biology, the, the Marcelo comes from physics, there's a guy from journalism, there's also a psychologist and lawyer. So we had the perfect team to get it going. We founded the institute in 2018 and, and then uh, after one year working with science communication we published a magazine we published still uh, it's an online magazine and it's really doing well we have an average of 70 to 100 thousand readers a month during the peak of the pandemic we had over uh, in one single day we had over 200 thousand readers so uh, we became really influential and of course uh, the pandemic hit so all of a sudden Brazil and of course all the world needed science-based information given to people in a professional way by people who really know how to communicate science. So uh, IQC really be became really influential in Brazil, helping the media get the stories right and actually bringing science to everyone in all sorts of media outlets. So we started with the magazine now I have two radio shows, two weekly radio shows in one of Brazil's largest radio stations and I also write a column for Brazil's largest newspaper, a weekly column. Uh, so uh, we, we kind of really broadened the scope. I was on TV as a as a news commentator every other day during the pandemic. Now, of course, it's more spaced and it's good because I, I, I still have a day job. It's not easy, of course, uh, going through all these steps, but I think it's necessary because if science communication remains informal, it's very difficult to get it to really influence public policies, politicians, parliament members. And of course, we can get information there to, to millions of people if you have a, a very popular YouTube channel. But is it going to decision makers? Is it going, is this information going where we can, where we can really make a difference? So this is why we, we understood that we had to, to take another level and really do it professionally, institutionalized, and, and of course, be held, be held accountable for what we do. My advice was to, uh, if someone wants to really engage in science communication and advocacy, to do it professionally, to do it with an association, with a team, uh, an interdisciplinary team. We scientists, we were not trained for science communication and training is required. We need to be able to talk to politicians and parliament members or to journalists, depending on what we do. We have to be prepared for that. These are skills that need to be taught. They are not intuitive. And when we try to do it very informally, we make a lot of mistakes that sometimes can make a very, very good intention work go to waste. So my advice would be really, if you want to do it, uh, do it professionally. Uh, seek advice, start an organization, talk to people who are already in the field. There is no need to reinvent the wheel. So get help, get organized, get a good team together, and, and do it because it's so necessary. So I, I think that there are very good materials out there that you can use and uh, I'm, I'm going to make them available here uh, for you. Uh, so there's, uh, there's some manuals on how to communicate. I, li I really like John Cook's manual. It's called the Debunking Handbook. And it has a lot of very, very practical tips on how to present information. So one of the things that he says is what he calls the truth sandwich. And he says that you have to start every piece of communication with the fact 
then you explain, uh, you, you mention the fallacy or the disinformation, uh, you mention it only once, but never in the title or at the beginning. You begin with the fact, then you mention the disinformation or the fallacy, then you explain what it is about, and you close again with the fact. So you have a fact sandwich, a truth sandwich. And the reason, he says, is that people usually begin with the fallacy. People are saying that vaccines are bad for you. And said, don't, don't do that. You begin by stating that vaccines are safe, and you close by reinforcing that idea. And in the middle, you can then debunk the bunk. But, uh, so it's very simple tips, but they do make a lot of difference when conveying the message to the public. So this is one too. There's also a wonderful paper of Cornelia Batch and Philip Schmidt. They wrote uh, uh, several papers, but there's one about uh, how to talk to deniers and how to debate. So they give a lot of tips on, tech, uh, on, on debate techniques uh, that you can use. It's very difficult to get into a conversation with science deniers. It's not always advisable, but sometimes you just can't get away from it. So if you have to do it, there are lots of tips that can help you. This paper is one of them. Uh, what I personally learn throughout these years is uh, you have to be very careful not to engage with trolls and deniers on social media. And I know that some of us, we, we start uh, talking uh, on, on social media, on Twitter, on Facebook, whatever social media that we use, and we get carried away. So people are saying, uh, pseudoscientific things and we want to correct it we want to we want uh, at least our followers to get the the correct information but you have to be very careful because usually these people they are uh, there's a reason we call them trolls and they are not there for the information they don't care about the information they want engagement so don't engage in social media if you have something to say write an article for a magazine uh, or, 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 or at least if you're going to record a video, record a video on YouTube that can be available uh, uh, for everyone anytime they want to access that. I, I think this is the hard part, getting the universities and colleges to, to, uh, to uh, understand how science communication is important as a field of research. I think that that's the greatest challenge now. Uh, I have actually just put together a group of professors who are teaching critical thinking in their colleges and universities by their initiative. They, they decided that it was important and they could get it past the board. So they are teaching critical thinking courses. We all got together to try to really make a case that we want, uh, we need to have uh, this officially into the curriculum of colleges and universities, and not just for science majors, but as I said, for anyone who works with public health or policy. And uh, we are trying to come up with what we think could be a core curriculum for a critical thinking course so that anyone around the world can have some information and say, well, I want to start a critical thinking course, but I don't know where to begin. It's very important that university boards acknowledge how essential it is to develop those skills. It's not that we want to turn everyone into science writers or YouTubers, but as scientists, these skills are also necessary. We have to learn how to communicate beyond our peers, even if we're not going to work professionally with science communication. And science communication has to be recognized as its own field of research, because there is a lot of research in science communication, and it has to be understood and it has to be acknowledged into the curriculum. I think my, my final words would be not to give up if you really uh, want to bring critical thinking courses into your university, you think this is important, uh, 
talk to me. Uh, I, I'm available. You you have all my contact information. Uh, if you're if you're already teaching critical thinking skills in your university, you also want to you reach out and uh, start an organization I, I, in your country, in your city. I think it's important to, to really put a team together of, of people from different fields to work with science communication. You you don't have to do it alone, and I think this is very important. We are not trained to do it alone, and we shouldn't, because it really requires a lot of different disciplines and skills to build science communication. So that, that would be my advice. Thank you.